facilitate that. Um, I'm going to go through um, the first of two sessions, which as Nick said is um, open countryside, and then we'll move into scrub, which is part of the sort of the countryside um, um, family. Um, the original sessions were going to be general first and wood, um, but we've reversed them um, primarily because of the, um, the fact that you've now got the opportunity to get out into the countryside. Um, and we're going to cover some of the warbler species tonight and some of the species that will stop singing um, fairly soon. So with what you hear tonight and see tonight, um, you've got the opportunity to get out and do a bit of practice before they, uh, they shut up shop and, uh, and start breeding um, for the rest of the uh, rest of the summer. Um, I'm going to cover about um, well, in excess of 30 species tonight. Um, so we're not going to get uh, um, everything uh, on every species, but we're going to put you in sort of um, a frame of mind where you, if you, you, you encounter one of possibly two species or three species, then you know what to look for, what to listen for, um, in order to, to help you make the, uh, the right identification. Um, we've got lots of um, soundtracks for you to, to listen to. And um, we've also got some pointers from um, the good, uh, good old Collins guide that you'll be, you'll be seeing on, on most of the slides. Um, but by way of introduction to um, the birds of the open countryside, um, so let me just uh, stop the video and you just see the slide then. Is that okay? Can you still see the slide? Yes, yep. Yep, yep. good. Yep. Um, as this is combined with the surveying um, and the training that we were going to be doing, I just thought it would be worth putting a slide up in terms of, of helping you to, to, to make that first start, um, to get into the sort of the surveying feel uh, of how to go around um, your square, um, what to look for, what to think about before you've even started sort of um, walking the route uh, and, and seeing a bird. Um, it's, it's different from normal bird watching. You can pitch up, you can get out at Otmore, you can get out of the car, you can walk and you can, you can see what you can find. Surveying is, is slightly different. You've got to be reasonably aware in terms of what sort of habitat that you're going to be covering, what sort of species that you might be seeing, and also um, obviously taking some time to look at the lie of the land that you're actually in uh, and try and, and, as you build some knowledge of the species that you're looking at and looking for, um, try and think about where you might encounter those species on the way. Um, and then you, you stand much better chance of, of bumping into them or going um, towards a particular area of scrub or bushes or whatever um, on the basis that you are actually going to find that, that, that particular species. So when you get out of the car and stop, you're at the, the end of the footpath, um, just have a, have a think about the species that you're, you're going to be looking for during the course of that, that walk. Um, Look at the habitat, the hedgerows, the, the copses, the bushes, maybe the streams, the types of arable, um, arable set aside, woodland or, or parkland or wherever you are, and just try and think um, what birds um, might be where in, in relationship to, to the walk that, you, that you're going on. And also, if you're doing the walk for a second or third time, just try and remember what you saw, where, and that will help you potentially to, uh, to relocate things as you, as you go around. One of the, the things that uh, probably um, I've learned over the, over the years is to try and bird more without the use of binoculars. Um, and it's, it's, if, if you can get to, um, in some areas, you can sort of, you can try and get to an 80-20 an split between you can actually do more with sound than you can with sight. And I think this is particularly important when you're trying to do surveying of, of species because if you can hear something and you know it's present and it's singing, then you know it's potentially uh, a breeder in the right habitat. You don't need to see it necessarily, uh, and this will give you more time to get on uh, and to look at look for further birds and try and add to the uh, the total that um, that you're looking for. Um, one of the things that we would that myself and Simon would have would have done um, with you in the proper training sessions would be to to start practicing um, trying to identify small birds in flight by their, their jizz. Um, as Nick said, um, jizz is a general impression of size and shape. It's a second world war um, term for identifying um, bombers and, um, 
um, fighter uh, fighter um, planes. Um, but hopefully we'll get the chance to cover this in a lot more detail in, in future sessions. So um, um, just to move on. Um, so we have a whole bunch of different um, countryside types. So if you think of the open countryside, you've got arable, you've got all these ones that are listed here. Most of these are represented um, within um, Buckinghamshire. Probably Heathland is the um, probably the lowest percentage of, uh, of um, area in, in Bucks. But there's plenty of arable, plenty of pasture set aside. We've got some nice downland uh, up on the Chilterns um, and common land and, and parkland um, nearby. Lakes, ponds and rivers, um, we're not going to be covering during the course of these two sessions. Um, so uh, um, that will be the, the subject of something I think Nick might be thinking about sort of after after the summer um, as a sort of a, a different um, different exercise. So within the open countryside, um, these are the sorts of um, areas of interest um, that you're going to be thinking about when you're looking at um, your, your patch, your area, your square that you're going to be surveying. And you're going to be looking for things like the small copses, game cover, where you might find some species, um, some of the finches, um, some of the thrushes later on in, in, in the summer stroke autumn. Field edges, um, especially if there's, there's a nice wide field edge that's been sort of set aside a bit, um, where some of the, um, the game birds might get, uh, and some of, the, uh, some of the smaller buntings and, and finches. Edge rows are obviously very important. Um, the older they are, obviously the, the wider the, uh, the, the, the value um, to wildlife in terms of the uh, seeds and, and um, everything else that, that grows within them. Fences, don't ignore fences. Um, various species can sit on those, so they're always worth looking at. Uh, you never know quite what you, what you might find. High bits and low bits, again, it's a different, different, slightly different habitat to, to what the rest of the field or what the rest of the area might have, and therefore it's, um, it's certainly worth focusing on. Scrub is a very important area, especially for warblers, and um, Simon will be covering that as part of the, uh, the second session. Um, and then we've got sort of waterside vegetation, um, which for this particular perspective, we're sort of looking at um, sort of streams and, and um, uh, riversides. And then don't forget to take into account um, the four seasons that we, uh, that we encounter through the course of the year. And each of those will bring with them um, different species and different opportunities for looking for things. Um, so just to, to cover, this is a view across from um, somewhere near Ivinghoe Beacon, I would think, um, just to show in the variety of, of, of cover there. You've got woodland, you've got copses, hedgerows, um, villages, got, um, field crops and, and uh, hay fields and so on and so forth. Bit of downland, um, nice, nice interesting pieces. Um, don't ignore the, um, the cattle. You never know what you might find feeding around underneath the cattle feeding on the flies. You've got the hedgerows, um, you've got the tussocks and things. You can find all sorts of things in, in, in those areas. And then um, a small stream with a bridge, lots of nice vegetation growing alongside it, along with hedgerows and, and the odd bush. Always worth scanning um, to see what might be sitting on the bush singing like a yellowhammer or a corn bunting. And of course, there's, there could be wires and it, the electricity wires going across um, the area. Don't ignore those either. They could be holding a, a nice peregrine or a kestrel or something, something similar. And then there's uh, Parkland. This is, this is um, Hewenden Park just down the road from myself. Um, very nice to, uh, to wander through, especially at this time of year. Had two pairs of spot flies today. Um, and uh, I think on my walks this morning, um, just to sort of um, uh, make, make the point in terms of what you can see in here. I went out um, this morning with the dog without any binoculars. And I went out again looking for spotted flies um, at a later stage. I had 34 species in total, of which 27 were heard um, and um, four um, were, were only seen through binoculars. So uh, it does make a difference in terms of, of, of the number of species that you can rack up. So, on to the birds. What species may you encounter? We're not going to go through all of these in the next um, 20 minutes or so, um, but we will go through all of them um, over the course of the, uh, the two uh, this week and next week. Um, 
so we'll, we'll pitch right in and um, you'll get the feel for the, uh, the format that we're going to be using. Um, as Nick said, any questions, fire them off to Nick. Um, there, is a, there is a point at the end that you can ask some questions as well and we'll try and answer any that you may have. Now, I'm going to base this on um, the fact that most people will be fairly new to birding and to surveying. Um, so if you know more than, than, uh, than that, then please bear with us. Hopefully you will still get something out of the session. Um, but uh, we're, we're pitching this at um, uh, a reasonably low level so that everybody can uh, hopefully get something out of it. Okay, so I'm going to introduce you to a couple of game birds, um, red-legged and, and grey partridges. Um, quite often um, you'll see them, um, there'll be a, a scanner field and you'll see a, a group of um, sort of greyish brown lumps um, quietly feeding in the middle of the field um, and you want to know which species they are. Are they going to be a red leg partridge or a, a grey partridge? And looking at the bottom at the, uh, at the Collins um, field guide pictures, they're obviously um, very, very different indeed, but at a distance with their heads down uh, and feeding and, and just sort of getting on with life, um, it can be difficult to see some of the salient features. So I've used some of the arrows here to, to point out um, the bits to look for. Um, obviously with red leg partridge, um, it's got a nice red legs, it's got a nice red beak and a red eye ring, uh, and it's also got this big black piece on, on the throat. But the key thing probably for, for both species, if you just see the backs, is that red leg partridge has a, a plain back, and the grey partridge has uh, a, a much more speckled, streaky back. Um, so as a result, um, even if they don't lift their heads, you'd be able to, uh, to identify them. This is the, uh, the song of the red-leg partridge. It's pretty distinctive. Um, should go once more. You can just hear it in the distance. There we go. Now this in the background, this is the, um, the grey partridge now, much more simple. Much shorter and slightly quieter. Please bear in mind that some of these recordings will be fairly quiet, some will be quite, quite loud. We've, we've taken all the recordings from a, a website called Zeno Canto. Um, which is a, a fabulous uh, resource when you're looking for, uh, for recordings. We'll give you the address of that um, at the end of the session today. Um, so that's the, uh, the two partridges. You'll see them, as I say, in the middle of fields. You'll find them at the edge of um, set-aside fields. You can, you can scare them from underneath a hedgerow um, and they'll, they'll make a lot of noise as they fly off. But they are size-wise, they are nowhere near like the size of a, of a pheasant. Um, and they will tend to uh, they will tend to run um, as well as, as like pheasants do. They they will tend to run into a field and, and hide, and squat. Um, same as pheasants, but um, as I say, they are they are much smaller. Moving on to a couple more game birds. Um, I've I've included quail because with a bit of luck, somebody somewhere in the county um, might just hear. Um, the song of the quail. Um, I'll play it now. It's very faint. Sounds very much like a sort of wet my lips um, type of phrase. Um, they'll be sitting in the middle of a cornfield somewhere and you won't see it for sure um, because they are they are very small, um, very secretive. And even if, even if there was, uh, even if you have one sort of within 10, 12 feet of you um, in the crop, um, you still probably wouldn't see it because it would just, um, just run around you and uh, you just wouldn't see it move. But uh, it's, a, it's a rare bird, but it does turn up in, in bucks and um, it would be great if somebody gets the opportunity to, to hear one in a, in a crop field somewhere 
um, in the county during the survey. Um, pheasant, no, I don't think anybody needs any real sort of introductions to, uh, to the pheasant. Big, loud, um, long-tailed, very speckly for the female, um, and uh, generally take a, a lot of noise and um, tend to get released um, towards the autumn um, for the shooting season. This is one of the typical calls um, that you'll hear. Pretty, pretty familiar to everybody, and especially if <coughs> one explodes out from underneath your feet and gives you a heart attack. Moving on to um, the red kite and the common buzzard. Um, obviously, uh, I'm sure everybody is absolutely familiar with, with red kites now. Common buzzards have, um, have taken advantage of the, uh, um, the red kite reintroduction scheme and they've, they've moved into bucks in, and across the whole of Southeast England in, in really big numbers over the last um, 10, 15 years. It's been quite incredible. They are very common. Um, you can probably see them on a, on a daily basis on your, on your walks. Um, and typically, um, if, you're, if you're not too familiar with them, um, you might um, hear them more than, than you actually see them to start with. And uh, this is the call. A bit of a, a mew-like call. And if you look up into the sky and you see a bird with fairly broad, rounded wings, uh, and, a, and a rounded tail, then, then that's, the, uh, that's the common buzzard. Um, if you see them sort of head on or tail on and they're soaring around, they do make a, a very distinct V shape, um, holding the wing tips much, much higher than the body, which is something that um, the red kite rarely does. The red kite tends to sort of hold its wings fairly flat, um, even with the wing tips sort of slightly drooping. Uh, and obviously with the, uh, the red kite, you've got um, the tail that it seems to drag along with it, which is, um, which is nicely forked and a, a, and a good sign. Um, but if you see them head on, they're, they're much more um, flatter in terms of um, their, their profile than the, a soaring common buzzard. Common buzzard, um, you're likely to see it perched on uh, telegraph poles, uh, hedges, tall bushes. Um, and they'll sit there and they'll be looking, looking out for, uh, for, for nests and, and for, for likely prey. Um, quite variable in, in colour, um, but the one shown in flight um, here is a sort of a, quite a lightish one, but um, tend, they can tend to go a bit sort of browner around this area here. But um, as I say, they're, they're, they're pretty common and you're bound to uh, encounter them um, on a walk or two. This is the red kite call. Everybody's familiar with it. So um, I'm sure you've all heard it many, many times, almost ad nauseum. <clears throat> Moving on to uh, a couple of uh, the uh, interesting uh, raptor species, um, hobby and the uh, peregrine. So these are relatives of the kestrel. Um, the hobby is a summer visitor, summer migrant, arrives in, in April, uh, end of April, beginning of May, um, will leave us in, in August, September. And the peregrine um, is a fantastic successful story um, from virtually none many years ago, through, due to DDT poisoning and so on, recovering fantastically and, and now breeding in, in Buckinghamshire in, in small numbers, which is... Uh, Absolutely fantastic. Um, now the hobby um, is a bird of the, the open countryside. It'll nest in, in small copses. Um, it, its primary diet is um, sort of dragonflies and flying insects. So it's very nimble, very active. Um, it can look very swift-like uh, at times because it flies with its, its wings um, slightly backwards like uh, this diagram, this uh, picture here. Um, and very aerial, spends all its time pretty much in the air. And if it's flying very erratically um, because it's catching insects, then that gives you a clue in terms of um, um, that it might be a hobby. Um, two circles on, on the bird here. 
Um, at the back end, it's got these, if you get a very good view, then you can see these uh, Rufus undertail coverts. Um, and if you look at the, uh, the, the throat and the belly and the, the head of this bird, it's, it's very well streaked um, rather than barred, which is, uh, tends to be a feature of certainly an adult peregrine, um, which is the sort of one that you'll probably uh, encounter at this time of year. Now the peregrine is um, uh, obviously a much bigger, more powerful bird. Uh, it's got much broader um, wing bases um, and it's got a, a shorter but very much broader tail. And it's just, it just gives, if you see them, when you see one flying, it just gives that, that real impression of power uh, and, and size compared to the, the hobby, which is quite small and dainty. It's not much different in size than the Kestrel. It's probably sort of slightly smaller. Um, and as I say, it's uh, much a bird of the open countryside. Peregrines, you can encounter anywhere pretty much these days. Um, so looking on pylons, is is a must in your square because you never know what you might uh, you might see uh, find one on on one there so um just to to play the two calls it's a bit uh, a bit faint the hobby call but um quite falcon like sort of quite kestrel like whereas you move on to the uh, the peregrine it's quite raucous and it's almost uh it can almost almost be dull like um in in that particular uh, instance so uh, so that's that's hobby and and peregrine um obviously hobby is most like the kestrel um but it's very differently patterned underneath um and and on top um, and kestrel, if you, if you see the bird hovering, then you know it's going to be a kestrel and, uh, and not going to be a hobby. Okay, so we're going to move on to the, the corvids um, or the crows, as you probably know them. Um, we're going to do four species and we're going to go through these individually and then look at, uh, look at them together um, just to try and help you make some distinction between the, uh, the, the four different species. Um, starting off with the uh, the smallest, um, probably the, uh, the, the in some ways the, uh, the the cutest of the four, um, the ones that you get around the, the the villages and the hamlets, nesting in chimneys, um, waking you up in the mornings and the evenings, um, and this is the jackdaw, um, smallest of the the four corvids, but obviously larger than um, uh, any of the. Uh, the local birds that you'll get in your garden, um, bigger than a bigger than a missile thrush, um, probably I don't know what sort of size comparison would it be. Uh, let me think about that, and I'll come back to you. Um, but the key thing uh, about the jackdaw, especially in terms of the adults, um, is this this pale grey nape, um, the black cap, and the and the white eye. And if you see them, they'll be they'll be moving around in the fields, potentially feeding. Um, I saw some on a couple of occasions over the last few weeks, standing on um, some heifers uh, and actually pulling the the, um, the hair off the uh, the heifers to take home for their uh, for their nests, um, which I've I've never never seen before. So it's quite uh, quite fun. Um, just play the call for you. You should be familiar with it. Very much a sort of a, a squawk. And you probably, they'll, they'll probably be fairly close, um, sort of within a few hundred yards of, of, of habitation um, most of the time, um, especially during the summer when they're, when they're rearing the young. In the winter, they do flock up and, and go to uh, communal roosts, but at this time of the year, you'll see them in, in singly or in, in pairs mostly. Um, although, having said that, the, uh, they all fledged this morning in, in the village here. Um, so there was a, a little flock of was about 20 birds that suddenly took to the air off the local playing field and, and, uh, and started chasing each other around for food. So that's the jackdaw. Um, we move on to the rook. Um, now the rook, um, if you see 
Um, lots of carrion crows together, they're rooks. If you see one rook on its own, it's a crow. Um, an old adage that, that sort of doesn't have quite so much credence now. Um, so what to look for on a rook um, is, it's the glossiest of the, of the four species to my mind. Uh, the photograph shows it quite well, it is quite glossy. Um, obviously nests commonly in a, in a rookery, quite noisy. Um, they fly out together to feed in the fields, um, spend a lot of time all, all together. Um, and you look for the, the sort of the peak, if they're in the middle of a field and, and maybe 100, 200 yards away and you're trying to identify which of the crows it is, you've got this very peaked head um, and you should be able to see the gray coming back to below the eye. Um, all the other crows that we're looking at have got very black beaks and a lot of feathering on the, on the upper mandible um, along here. So the rook doesn't, it's very bare, and that's, uh, that's a good telltale sign from, from a long way off. You'll all be familiar with the, the crow, with, with the rook's call. And that's especially if you live near a rookery. Um, carrying crow, what can you say about carrying crow? It's a bit of a big lump, really. It's got nothing much going for it. Um, it's not glossy. It's not, not really good looking. Um, it's, it's a big lump of a, a black bird. Um, makes a... Not particularly great noise either. So there's, there's not a lot to recommend it, really. Um, especially as it's spending most time around my pond trying to catch my tadpoles at the moment. <coughs> Um, normally seen singly um, and and or in pairs. Um, you quite often see them if they're nesting nesting at the moment and got young um, and a kite flies over. You'll see them trying to chase, fly up and chase the kite away, making um, making some f sort of fairly pathetic noises, to be honest. Um, and that gives you an idea that they're, they're nesting in the in the vicinity. But um, yeah, that's that's. That's a carrying crow, they're, they're everywhere. You, you won't go out and, and not see one, I, I wouldn't think, no matter where you are. Um, now on to the, um, onto the, the king of the, uh, the crows, if you like. Um, this is another bird which is um, um, spreading uh, very successfully within Buckinghamshire at the moment, certainly on the Chilterns and south of the Chilterns, and I guess uh, Simon will can tell us later that um, I think it's it's spreading northwards towards Milton Keynes and uh, and that sort of area as well. Um, the biggest of the crows. Um, it is the size of a, a common buzzard, almost the size of a, a, a red kite. It is it is massive, um, and you can see from the picture here that um, uh, if you're looking at a, at a big bird of a big crow, then this this bill is huge and it does tend to have sort of slightly longer um, wings than, than a lot of the other crows and often very feathered, um, feathered top of the, the legs here. Um, for a bird of the size that it is, it can be surprisingly, um, you know, uh, it, it can be very difficult, inconspicuous is the word I'm looking for. Um, it, if it's quiet, um, it can fly over at quite a height. Uh, not make a noise and you, you might not notice it at all. But quite often the way that you do get um, um, knowledge of one around you is from the, the call itself. It really is very extremely distinctive and it carries a long way. And if you hear that, look up and you'll probably see one flying over at great distance. And if you see it flying over, um, what will grab your attention, apart from the, the size, is the, the wedge-shaped tail. Um, it really is very different from, from, from any of the other um, corvids in that respect. Sometimes they are incredibly tame as well. And um, I've seen them in, in Hewenden Park, um, feeding on the ground, um, not, not, not far from, from people. So they... they they can be quite bold at times. 
but um, they are a, they are quite a special corvid, very intelligent bird. So the corvids put the corvids together. The area to focus on really, if they're not in flight, is the is the head uh, and looking at the uh, looking at the size of the bill, um, the amount of feathering um, on the upper mandible. Um, as you can see with the rook, as I said, there's there's none there. With the carrion crow, there is some feathering here. There is some on the on the jackdaw, but obviously the the nape is the and the eye colour are the the things that will give it away. But on the raven, you can see the uh, the amount of feathering that that occurs here. One thing I didn't mention um, about rook and carrion crow when you see them in flight, um, the rook has much narrower wing bases uh, than carrion crow, so that might give you a, a tip in terms of uh, and which species you might be looking at. Okay, that's, um, that's sort of the big birds done. Now we move on to the LBJs or little brown jobs, um, which can be so infuriating for, uh, for everybody trying to get decent views. Um, so, what I'm pointing out here with the Skylark, um, again, a bird of the open arable area. Um, it's probably got to the stage now where <clears throat> most of the fields it will be nesting in have, have grown up to hide them, um, to hide getting good views of them on, on the ground. But you might see them singing from a song perch and obviously typically with Skylark then you'll, you'll hear them um, singing from way up in the sky and be difficult, difficult to see. But if you do get a view of one on the ground, um, looking at the head, you've got the crest here which isn't always raised but if it is it's obviously a, a very good giveaway. Um, but look at the beak here, it's, it's quite sort of triangular uh, and with the next species that we'll be looking at then that's the, that can help you to uh, separate the two if you're having any, any trouble. Um, down here, highlighting the fact that they do tend to, to crouch um, quite a lot, they don't tend to stand up upright, uh, they're very much a crouching type of bird um, and if you're into primary extension over uh, the length of the tertials and things which is something that again hopefully we'll get onto with future training sessions then the the primary feathers here do extend further than the the end of the tertials here um, just play the uh, the song I'm sure you're all familiar with it it can be infuriating sometimes to find the bird in the sky if it's, a, if it's bright blue, bright blue sky on a sunny day. But um, fortunately, we've still got plenty of them around the uh, around the county. I'm just going to move on and, and play the call as well, which might give you a clue if you hear a see a brown bird fly off in front of you, um, especially towards the autumn when they're, they're they're flocking up with the young and so on. Then you get this sort of call, very distinct. And if you see or hear one of those, then you know you've got yourself a, a skylark. So looking at the, the next species, which you might sort of find in a similar sort of area in terms of some arable land, they can tend to um, um, inhabit sort of slightly different in terms of the meadow pipit. They are a bit more of the, the open ground rather than the arable, but um, you, might, you might encounter them in both on a, a walk of mixed um, mixed farmland and so on. Um, meadow pipit, slightly, um, slightly less robust, tends to stand more upright. Um, as you can see from the, the head, um, obviously no crest, but the, the bill is longer and, and finer uh, and has a bit more colour on it. So that's something to look for. Um, the wings are, are, are shorter. There's no primary projection here over the, uh, over the tertials. Um, <clears throat> And the leg colour um, will, will help you, um, and the stance will help you to, uh, to identify them. Um, a couple of the, the song and the call can be given in, in song flight, but um, As you can hear, it's it's very very different from a from a skylark song, uh, and the call as well. Again, um, seeing them in autumn when they then there's migrants coming through, and there might be uh, more numbers around. 
uh, a very different call for you. Okay, moving on, um, we're going to look at um, two birds of the of the sky, <clears throat> one of which I'm sure you're familiar with, the, the barn swallow, or the swallow as um, we used to call it. Um, but just highlighting the fact here, obviously you're, you're aware of the, the long tail and, and so on, but this, the, the dark throat, if you see a bird up in the sky, um, it might be a young bird without the long tail feathers and so on, and it's, it's swooping around and you're wondering what it is, then um, have a look at for the throat, see what colour that is, or, or whether it's dark or whether it's light, and that'll give you a clue in terms of, um, of whether it's a swallow um, or, a, or a swift or a, or a martin. <clears throat> Obviously fly a lot lower most of the time, the in and out of barns, out houses, um, and if you're lucky enough to have any close to you, um, then obviously fantastic to have around, have them nesting in a, in a porch or an, um, as I say in an outhouse or a barn, something like that. Quite, uh, quite lovely to have. This is the call. Very twittery, friendly call. Um, compared with the swift, which is truly a bird of the sky, <clears throat> you see them um, up high. Um, see them in the evenings about this time of the year. They're starting to um, to cool, mate up. Um, they just they just swept back wings, dark. Um, and if you can see it when you're looking through binoculars or something, then you can see the fact that they actually do have a uh, a pale throat. But they are very very distinct um, when their wings are swept back. Uh, and when you see them, sort of July time when the the young are out. Um, and you get a, a flock like this in, in, in a, on a summer evening, flying around the village or something, or around the, around the countryside, screaming away, then they are, they are fantastic to, uh, to watch. But they are just arriving now. Um, they're looking for nesting sites. Um, there's plenty of um, schemes to, to try and encourage people into putting up um, swift nest boxes and so on to get, uh, to get them um, breeding in a, in a wider range of places as they are um, decreasing somewhat. And I'll just play the swift call so that you're, you're familiar with it. Not particularly loud recording. Okay, um, now another family which I'm sure you've got some familiarity with, um, at least one species. Um, there are three species that you might encounter um, while you're doing your, your surveying or walking in the countryside. Um, each um, involve different sort of habitats um, and they are all um, very different uh, once you know them, although they can be sort of slightly confusing um, if you don't know them that well. Um, looking at the grey wagtail, um, this is a, a bird that you see alongside streams, especially where there might be some small waterfalls or rapids, they tend to cl nest close to those sorts of areas. But you can find them in, in, in open countryside in many places, um, sometimes quite far from water. Um, now this picture is a nice adult male with the black throat um, and the, the bright yellow uh, underparts and, and under tail coverts here. But you do get um, some of the juveniles and, and females not quite so highly marked. So how do you identify um, a grey wagtail? Well, grey back and these yellow undertail coverts are always present. These are the two, two areas to look for um, on, on any of the birds. The combination of those two is unique. Um, in flight, um, if you get a grey wagtail in flight going over the top of you or see it from side on, there is a very obvious white wing bar. You can see it from, un from the underside and you can see it from the, from the upper side as well. So that's always one thing to, uh, um, to think of. And this is the call, quite sharp.
So moving on to the, uh, the, the pied wagtail, this is very variable as you can see from the, um, the, the picture, uh, the Collins picture below here. Um, again, this is another nice, uh, nice adult male in the photograph, but uh, always gray and white or, or black and white, um, and always have some semblance of black um, on the throat uh, and white on the head. So that's the bit that will differentiate and, the, and no, no yellow on the undertail coverts here. So you'll always differentiate it from, uh, um, from a, from a grey wagtail. This is the call. So much, much looser uh, and sort of softer than, uh, than the, the hard grey wagtail call. And then moving on to the, the third of the species now, these, um, the yellow wagtail um, can be seen around lakes um, and ponds, but it could also be found nesting in, in arable um, land as well. Um, they're quite often nesting in, in arable, um, I'm sorry, in, in rape fields um, and uh, in autumn groups um, when the young are out and then they start to um, group up, flock up, and you can often find them uh, around groups of cattle um, feeding under the cattle. So that's uh, a good sign. And it's, their, it's their, their plain yellow head. This is again, there's an adult male um, and a greeny back. Um, and irrespective of whether it's a male or a female, you'll always have this, this sort of combination of back. And if not fully yellow, then, then sort of slightly yellow. So and a very different call. Okay, so moving on to um, one of the finch species. This is this is the linnet. Um, it's a pretty ubiquitous bird of the uh, the countryside, farmland, um, arable land, anywhere where um, um, it's got thick bushes, hedgerows, um, gorse. It loves gorse, um, especially sort of around the coast. Um, very small brown bird. Um, probably the smaller than um, than the house sparrow, but not much smaller. Um, and it really is, it's a bird that will flick out of a hedge um, and fly 10, 20, 30 yards ahead of you and then go back into the hedge and then pop up on top. Um, look at you, might sing, um, or might just move along a bit further and so on. Um, adult male up here on, on the top. Key features here are the, the plain brown back, um, grey bill, um, but you also, also notice in flight, um, it's got white in the, in the wing, um, on the outer webs of some of the primaries, and white outer tail feathers. Female immature is much sort of, uh, much more nondescript, although well, well streaked. Um, but they, they often, you'll see them together, um, moving around together uh, in pairs and in family groups. Um, and they are, they are something that will turn up in, in I'm sure, on, on most of your, your walks. So now playing the call as well. Judging by the background noise on the call, it was obviously taken from, from some gorse near, a, near the seaside. Very much a, a bird of the, the local countryside. A um, bird that you might um, get com confuse it with um, if you don't see an adult male, but you see one of the uh, sort of female immature types, um, as I'm pointing out here. This is the, uh, the reed bunting. Um, slightly, slightly larger, um, slightly longer tail. Um, adult male, if you see the head, is, is unmistakable. Um, but again, um, it can appear in rape fields, arable fields. Uh, will tend to dive into cover more than a, than a linnet will, uh, and then work its way out um, if you give it time just to, 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 to let it um, get used to you, and, it, and it'll start to appear from the side of a hedge or the top of a hedge, whereas a linnet is 
is a bit more obvious a bit more quickly. Um, but well streaked um, above on the back, white sort of tram lines down the back of the uh, of the bird, um, streaked underneath. Um, it's, it's one of those birds that when, when you start to get more into understanding the, the structure of a bird, you've got all these different um, superciliums and ear spots and moustachial stripes and malar stripes and so on. So that's something to, uh, to look forward to in the future. This is, this is the call. Quite high, very single note. Very different from the uh, from the linnet. Um, another member of the uh, the bunting family. This is the yellowhammer. So this is this is one that you would hope to uh, to come across on your walks. Um, how does it differ from the the reed bunting? Obviously, if you see the male, then you can see the uh, the, the yellow. Um, what um, the yellow hammer has that the rebunting doesn't have is a, a, a rusty um, rump. Um, so hidden by the wings here, it's um, it's very rusty, uh, which the rebunting doesn't have. Um, the size of the bill is is bigger, a um, bit more hefty. Um, it's a slightly longer tailed and slightly sort of perhaps a slightly larger bird and will tend to sit out more on tops of um, um, bushes and hedgerows and, and perch on, on wires occasionally. Um, and obviously with the, uh, the well-known song, Little Bit of Bread and No Cheese. The song working up and then going down uh, down at the end. Then the call, which is very different, much so again a species that, um, that hopefully you'll all get to get to encounter on your on your walks. Um, so the tail tail length is much longer than the, than the linnet and the uh, and the reed bunting. And then um, finally for the uh, the corn bunting, um, this is one which we hope you'll find. It's not common, um, but it's the it's another bunting species, and it's the largest of the ones that you're likely to encounter um, if you're lucky to do so. It's a it's a bit of a lump of a bird. It's bigger than the yellow hammer. Um, it, it can, it, if it's sitting on a, on a wire and singing, it can look sort of very heavy. It's got a much, much larger bill, as you can see, uh, much more brightly colored. Um, its legs are, are, are quite bright. Uh, and when it flies, it often dangles them, um, which is a, a good clue when you see them in flight. And often the, 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 the markings around here, around the upper breast and, and throat, can form a sort of a bit of a black patch um, if you can see them from a distance. Um, <clears throat> but they'll sit on a telegraph wire or on a bush, and if they're flushed, um, then they'll sort of fly off, not too far, but fly off to the next bush, uh, and then they'll probably start singing from, from there. Um, no white in the tail um, of this bird, whereas Yellowhammer and Reed Bunting and Linnet all have white in, in their tail. This is the song. So sort of quite sort of wheezy in, in its uh, nature. As I say, it's not it's not a common bird in in, in bucks. So it'd be great um, if um, some of you managed to come across it on your uh, on your walks. And this is the call. Quite quiet call. Sorry, I've mixed, I'm mixed it in with the uh, the song there. Apologies. 
but you'll get these and you'll be able to play them back to your uh, your heart's content. Um, so yeah, so just the uh, the linnets and the buntings here. Um, the two linnets at the bottom, the male on the left hand side, the female on the right, uh, and then you've got yellow hammer on the left, the reed bunting in the middle and the corn bunting on the right. As I say, the corn bunting is the only species with no white in the tail of all of these ones that you can see here. The yellow hammer is probably the next biggest with the next longest tail. Hopefully if you see the males then, then you recognize them straight away. Female, um, if you see the flight then you'll see the, the, the rusty red rump and hopefully there'll be some yellowish around the head for you to see. Um, reed bunting, very brown above, quite whitish underneath. Um, less streaks so than, than yellow hammer. And then linnet which is uh, as I say, it's, it's a pretty ubiquitous bird and you should see those fairly easily. So that's, that's the end of my session. Um, so any questions or perhaps we might need to uh, break and give Simon a chance to set up and then, um, then move on given the time. So uh, to carry on the amazing the, uh, theme that uh, Dave did earlier. So the reason that we split scrub birds out is because I know a lot of you re have been talking to us on the WhatsApp group about warblers. So we really wanted to focus on the warblers. Uh, so my, my species list is only 11. Um, but we're going to be focusing on the, the types of things that you're probably going to come across in, in terms of the scrub. Now, uh, I deliberately went out last night and yesterday morning, actually, uh, into some scrub, and then I went out into some arable farmland. And because I know what Dave was saying this morning, he sort of had 34 species and that. But uh, sometimes when you go on a, on a walk, you, uh, I was I was out for an hour last night on the in some arable farmland, and I recorded nine species. But they were yellow hammer, they were white throat, they were uh, linnet, they were yellow wagtail. They were ones that Dave's been talking about. So. The idea is that we uh, recognise where you are within the uh, within the um, your habitat, which will give you a real good clue as to types of birds that uh, that you might see. Um, when I took the photograph on the left, that's uh, uh, that's at Limford in Milton Keynes. Uh, there were there were two white throat territories within that sort of general area. Behind me, I could hear a black cap. Uh, over my shoulder was a wren. So, as I say, just that using your ears when you're just sort of standing in the middle and letting it, letting it all flow in. Um, as we can see uh, from the uh, picture on the right, uh, sometimes scrub is a little bit more woody uh, grown up. Um, you're more likely to get the uh, garden warbler, willow warbler, chiff chaff in the slightly taller trees. But we'll, we'll talk about that as we, uh, as we go through. Um, so I'm focusing on those 11 species down on the left hand side. The reason that the others are in uh, are in brackets is when we were putting these species together, it was uh, we we these are the sort of ones you're more likely to encounter in scrub. Some of these birds are in are in some slides right at the end, but for the rest of them we're going to be covered and covering those off next week. So we're going to be looking at a couple more raptors. Uh, cuckoo then we're going straight in for the rest of the session is about warblers and I know a lot of you have been on the whatsapp group have been asking us to identify various bits and uh, uh, most of the time it comes out as uh, white throat or black cap uh, as you go along you're, 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 there are some other mm -hmm. warblers out there as well so uh, following on from what Dave said earlier sparrowhawk kestrel these are probably the two most likely uh, species that you're going to come across within that scrubby uh, countryside area. Um, they're quite distinctive when you see them. Sparrowhawk flat, flat glide, if you remember that, flat, flat glide. Uh, they tend to, uh, when they're in direct flight, uh, they'll be flat, flat glide, or they'll be spiraling up, they'll be spinning up. They've got much broader wings than Kestrel, and you'll be able to see the fingers, which are the, uh, uh, the ends of the uh, wings for, for raptors. Kestrel, as you can see on the right there, much, uh, much uh, more compact, much smaller, obviously hovering. Uh, I'm not going to give you the old English name for that because it's got a rude word in it. Um, but when they hover, uh, you know, typically you'll be going, oh, is that a sparrowhawk? Oh, it's hovering. It's a kestrel. Uh, is that a sparrowhawk or a kestrel? Ah, oh, it's spiralling up and it's doing a flat, flat glide. It's a, uh, it's a sparrowhawk. Uh, once again, all of these slides are going to be made available to you. Um, I've, I've heard a kestrel a couple of times in my 36 years career and I've heard Sparrowhawk once I think so there's not really much in any of the songs around those. Um, 
sometimes mistaken for a raptor, of course, is the cuckoo. Now, you, if you're really lucky, you will see one in that top, uh, that top form. That's him in mid cuckoo with his wings stretched back, his tail arched, uh, and that really loud cuckoo uh, coming out. Uh, but when you see them in flight, they, they do appear very raptor-like, very, um, many cases you think, oh, is that, a, is that a hobby? And then actually, no, it's a, it's a, it's a cuckoo. Very long-tailed in flight, really, really quite obvious, but those, those wings are dropped down. Um, but typically, as Dave said, when you go out, you scan those uh, hedges and uh, tops of tall trees, and you might just be lucky to see that uh, very distinctive silhouette. What you'll probably hear more often is this. <laughs> unmistakable hopefully um right so uh we've got the sort of the more moderately easier ones out of the way uh, and again if anyone's uh, if anyone's got any questions or want me to repeat any of the songs or anything so we're going slapping you straight into warbler identification now as i said 36 years in the birding game Every time a garden warbler, a black cap, a white throat, a lesser white throat goes off, I'm, which one's that? So even now, after all these time, you just, you, you have to listen to the subtleties. You have to learn the song. Uh, what we're giving you really is just a, a very brief overview here. But there's nothing more um, useful than to actually watch the birds sing. Uh, when you see a black cap, doing it so it'll raise its crest and it'll do its really scratchy song and you can see it's only for a short period of time uh, and then when, when you see a garden warbler singing and it's warbling away and it's it's going on for a long period of time uh, and they've just got they've got different qualities to it which we'll explain in a minute when you see a garden warbler uh, it's often been described as one of the most boring warblers uh, we do have some resplendent warblers out there uh, but I love garden warblers, really subtle, a little grey around uh, the eye, at the back of the eye there, we call them the ear covets, uh, nice grey wash there, and that sort of that browny sort of flank sheen. Um, as you can see there on the bottom right hand side from the Collins Guide, it really does pick out those little items for you. Now, I'd describe this as fluty. This is a, is a really um, yeah. conversationalist song. It will, it will... It will lift your heart when you hear it. And, and when, you, when you get one and you've been listening to Black Cats, the, the, the subtlety is really, uh, is really quite key. Um, what you've also got with the garden warbler is typically, not always, typically they're a bit higher up in the foliage. Uh, black Cats really like singing in the middle of scrubby areas. Uh, garden warblers like scrubby areas, but with some tall trees. So uh, potentially if, you, if you've got one that's quite high up, uh, check if you think it's a garden warbler, try and see it. Um, but again, black caps can sing fun thing. So what we're listening out for garden warbler is this. The key thing there is it's almost unbroken. Okay, so it's it's warblery, fluty. Going. A little break, and straight away it's done. Okay, done. Now, visually completely different from the black cap. Uh, as I've, I've noticed here, you've obviously got a black cap and a red cap. The red cap, the, the brown cap, if you like, is the, is the female black cap. You typically, a lot of people sort of, oh, it didn't look like a black cap, didn't have a black cap. Although what you could hear is the black cap singing but you actually see the female bird. So the male's singing deep within scrub and the female birds are, uh, are, um, are chipping around the edges of the, uh, of the thing. Um, again, typically more lower down in the trees. Now, uh, if you listen to this song, what, what hopefully you'll hear is a bit more scratchy and certainly not as long as the garden warbler. Right. Break. See, it's a lot less fluty, it's a lot less, um, uh, I don't think it's as melodic. I mean, black cat's a lovely thing, it? but it's just, it's, it's that break, and that's the, uh, that's the key for me, is to, is to listen out for the breaks. 
Right, what normally gets confused with black caps is less so than garden warblers because for the most time you go, is that a garden warbler? And it turns out to be a black cap. The other side of the coin is, is that a black cap? And then it turns out to be a white throat. So we've been putting quite a lot of these calls and the songs. Now, I've deliberately steered away from the calls of garden warbler and black cap uh, because they, they just sound like chips, chip, 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 chip. There's no real sort of distinction, but the white throat, and when we when we hear the lesser white throat, they've got some slightly different uh, different calls as you'll as you'll hear. So one of the key things to remember about white throats is very scratchy, much more scratchier than the uh, than the black cap. Typically song flight as well. So if you see a song and then a bird parachute up into the sky and then come down, typically singing while they do that as well. And they're very much they like to sing on exposed branches, uh, exposed tops of scrub. Uh, love nettle beds, love, uh, uh, is it cow parsley, the, the white stems. Um, I'm lucky enough up here around Limford, uh, I, I, I've estimated that we've got 39 territories of white throat within a three square mile, which is incredible. The best year ever uh, for white throats as far as I'm, I'm concerned around here. Key thing to note here, brown patch is on the wings. Brown patch on the wing, clear white throat, and then that grayish head. Um, what we're going to listen to now is the white throat song, and as again, a bit distinct from the black cap, but I, I, hope, I hope you'll hear, but very scratchy and really quite short. If you imagine garden warble along, black cap shorter, and then white throat is probably even shorter. He's short. Very descending. See, just a very bit of different subtlety to it. So basically, you listen out for a scratchy song. If it starts going a bit descending and stopping straight away, chances are it's a white throat. No real mimicry, no real difference in the songs. Keeps the same pitch. Um, and then we're going to move on to the white throat uh, scold, which we've been hearing a lot on the uh, WhatsApp group. Um, typically, if you're too close to the nest or if there's a predator around or they're just feeling antsy, um, what they tend to do is they tend to scold you. Um, so this is the white throat scold. Different to any of the uh, any of the other calls, really, of, uh, of black cap garden warbler, uh, etc. Um, so often we, we often get uh, asked, oh, was it a white throat? Was it a lesser white throat? Well, they're actually quite subtly distinct birds. Um, my rule of thumb is, if you see a white throat, uh, let, let's say a white throat species, it's probably a white throat, i.e., common white throat. Uh, lesser white throats are really skulking. Uh, you, you hear them much more than you see them in my in my experience. Uh, when I said 39 territories of common white throat in the Limford area, one territory of lesser white throat. So they are much more more reduced in numbers. Um, but I say they're a lot more they're a lot more skulking. Uh, they're they're quite furtive in their movements as well. So if you're if you're hearing something and you think is it a white throat, it probably is a white throat because as we can hear the lesser white throat. Has a really distinctive rattle at the end of its song. Very short. A warble. So again, delivered from hawthorns, from small scrubby bushes, uh, typically a bird of hedgerows as well. Uh, but you can get them on the edge of, uh, of woodland, etc. Uh, the key thing here is they're all brown on the back. There's not there's not that chestnut wing panel that we saw of the of the white throat. Um, you will hear you will occasionally hear less than white throats call. They are a little bit different to the uh, to the scolding of the white throat. So uh, we'll just go through the song. This is the white throat call. Combined with that rattle. That 
I'll end with this. I know it's a sticky willow warbler in there, but we'll ignore that for now. Um, okay, so hopefully you've got garden warbler, black cat, two, two uh, mixed mix up birds, common white throat and lesser white throat. Um, we're going to move on now. You'll, you'll be very lucky uh, to hear one of these, not only for the fact that a lot of the grasshopper warblers have actually stopped singing now, uh, but if you're in next year, when you get out in those early mornings, I've heard grasshopper warbler many times, far away from, uh, from any water, any reed beds, uh, one time about five miles from, from anywhere, just in the middle of a, uh, in the middle of a farm. Uh, singing out of a hedgerow. So grasshopper warblers do turn up in uh, in very unusual places on migration. We've been lucky to have two of these at the, again at Linford Reserve near to where I live, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, the song is unmistakable. Uh, it uh, it uh, as you, hopefully you'll see. Uh, when we say unmistakable, there are other species that are much much rarer, but you don't need to worry about them. Um, it's been likened to a fishing reel. Uh, although that photograph is stunning, you probably won't see them like that. They'll be down in the bottom of the hedges. They'll be down in the uh, in the um, uh, the, uh, the crops or wherever they've set up, or in the middle of a nettle patch again. But occasionally, you get uh, you do get lucky. Um, and what you're listening out for here, as I say, is like a fishing reel. Now, it's quite a loud recording. If there's people on the call who can't hear it, uh, it's actually just to do with your pitch of your ears. Um, I, have, I have hearing aids. Without my hearing aids in, I, I, I actually can't hear grasshopper warbler because their pitch is set at that level. Um, the other thing as well is as soon as they turn their head uh, like this, it sounds as though they're coming from a completely different area. They're real, real ventriloquists when they're, when, they're, when they're calling. And you can probably hear a little bit on the recording when it, 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 it moves its head just slightly and you can hear it slightly, uh, slightly lower. There, there it's moved its head slightly. Some birds can reel for oh, yeah, 10, 15 minutes and they go without stopping. Fantastic sound of, uh, of spring if you can get to a reed bed where they've got grass up or blah. We deliberately left out reed warbler. So that's all I'm going to say for that. Just for the, for the fact that we are unlikely, for the most part, to come across them in some of the survey areas we do. Um, but obviously, if you come across a, uh, a warbler that uh, you need to record and we identify, it might well be a reed warbler. We've ignored that for now. Um, the other one that you're most likely to get in scrub is sedge warbler. Now, I've, I've, I've put it in the same loop, if you like, as grasshopper warbler. Uh, but the key thing is it's very, it's very different in, in looks and it's very different in song. Now, where you might get confused is sedge warblers just drop into the middle of anywhere. Um, uh, again, going back to that picture that I took at Limford, uh, which is probably about 150 yards from any water of any description, uh, there's a sedge warbler territory that's set up right in the middle of a black thorn bush. Um, so although they do commonly associated with reed beds and sedges, they can actually pretty much turn up anywhere, any hedgerow uh, during the migration season. Um, I've called this the bumpy roller coaster of a bird because it really is, it's a mimic, it's, uh, it's quite loud, um, if you're standing next to one in full voice, it's actually quite overpowering. If you're, uh, uh, if you're, uh, if you're, if you've got decent hearing, it's. Um, uh, and when you see it, uh, because again, if you, you you might be thinking, is it a reed warbler? Is it a sedge warbler? If you see it, that white over the eye, called the supercilia, uh, is a, is a telltale sign of sedge warbler. Little chunky, churly sort of uh, sound. repeated phrases as well. But again, sometimes when I, if I just hear something on, uh, you know, sort of a snatch of, of songs I walk past, uh, occasionally I do go, is that, was that a black cat? Is that a sedge warbler? Because they, can, they sound so similar in that scratchy level. Right, we're coming up to our, our green warblers, if you like. Uh, we have Chiff Chaff and Willow Warbler, the two common pairs in this one. Uh, chiff Chaff, hopefully you'll remember because it says its name, Chiff Chaff, Chiff Chaff. 
Uh, we'll go through the song in that in a minute. Um, what's really useful about what you're going to hear next is we're going to actually hear the call first. So the call of the of of the chiff chaff is probably one of the most uh, the, the most common calls that you would hear from any of the warblers. Um, and if you look there, it's a, it, 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 the, the call is wheat wheat, um, but it's a monosyllabic. It's just one wheat wheat. When we go on to willow warbler, uh, you'll see that they have a, a quite disyllabic spelling. It's a wheat. Um, but what we're going to hear now, we're going to hear the, the chiff chaff call, and then we're going to hear the chiff chaff song. Wheat, wheat, wheat. They're just one clump of wheat. Bang, straight into chiff chaff. And for the most part, what you'll hear with chiff chaff is you'll hear it go chiff chaff, chiff chiff, chiff chiff, chiff chiff, chaff, chiff chiff, chiff. So it has different pitches. And if you get one that sounds like a shit as well, but give me a ring because it'll be an Iberian chiff chaff. But enough about that. Um, so moving on, on to willow warbler. So we've got chiff chaff, which says its name. Uh, one thing I did point out, so I forgot to notice, is if you look at the legs, if you are lucky enough to see them and they're not singing, uh, black, uh, chiff chaff have black legs and they have a very small, as I've pointed there, uh, and Dave talked about this, well, their wings are smaller. They're a, they're, a much, uh, they're a shorter distance migrant, so they have much shorter wings. So if you are lucky enough to see one, they're also a bit drabber. They're the drabber out of the two, uh, the poor cousin in the, uh, in the Chiff Chaff Willow Warbler clan. As you can see there, that Willow Warbler is much fresher, brighter, the, the eye stripe, the supercilia is much more yellow. Uh, as you can see, longer wings there and, and almost orangey, bright feet, bright uh, uh, legs, as you can see there. Um, now, I call it the, the song winner as well. Willow Warbler gets it all, doesn't it? The Chiff Chaff, but the Chiff Chaff overwinters more. It's a bit harder. Um, the Willow Warbler, what we're going to hear now, we're going to hear the song, first of all. And if you, if you listen to the WhatsApp video that I posted yesterday, um, there, was, uh, there was at least five Willow Warblers in the tree that I was, where I was, oh, no, the wood where I was recording that. Uh, so Willow Warbler is a fantastic song, and for me it epitomises uh, 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 spring, really. So here we go. Real descending trill. Time. Almost, almost rushed at first. And then, if you remember the call that we had um, earlier from the chaff, when we start to play the willow warbler call. Wheat, wheat. Whereas the chiff chaff was wheat, wheat, wheat. So it's, uh, it's that difference between the two tone uh, and the single. Okay, right. Um, apologies, I have whizzed through a little bit. We've, got, uh, we've only got a few more. Uh, I'm just gonna go with a side by side of the, uh, of the confusion species. So we've got common white throat on the left there, uh, the brown wings, the white throat, the pale legs. Uh, you've got the, the yellow bill. Uh, you've got the crest raised and song flighting, common white throat. Uh, and then on the right hand side, you've got lesser white throat. So you've got brown back, uh, much paler underneath, again with the white throat, but that grey head, uh, more grey. There's, there's a different coloration if you see there's a darker grey within the lesser white throat. If it's song flighting and scratchy, common white throat. If it's in the middle of a bush and it's giving you a rattle, lesser white throat. Lesser white. Or common white. What do we think? Common white throat. Lesser white throat. Much more. Common white throat. White throat. Such a shell. That's a white throat. Garden warbler, again, the browner family of the, of the two, both with a slightly scratchier, but garden warbler, much more fluty, much more prolonged. Black cat, scratchy. 
Grass up warbler, very easy, uh, like a fishing reel. Dead warbler, scratchy, scratchy. Now you might even hear this if you're lucky. Grass up warbler singing on one side, and then a sedge warbler chuntering away, chuntering into its burden. We've got a really warbler, this actually happened, I had a, I've got a recording of exactly this. The grass up warbler in one bush, sedge warbler in another. Uh, we've got your chiff chaff and the willow warbler we just talked about. We've got the uh, warbler of the wheat. wheat. Remember the two tone is the uh, is the willow warbler, and then chiff chaff wheat, wheat. Uh, I think it's a bit, a bit more angry as well. Uh, I think the willow warbler's uh, call is a little bit more delicate. Okay, so a bit of a whirlwind around the warblers. Hopefully, you can go out now and start listening to a few warblers. If you've got your iPhone or, or your Android or whatever that is, uh, just hit in the video function when you're, when you're in the middle of um, uh, listening to something. Send it over. Dave, Nick, myself, Mike Collard, Tim, all the other, all the other birders on the thing will we'll do our best to identify it for you. Right, a sneak preview of next week now um, insofar as we're going to be talking about the, uh, the tits. Uh, we've got great tit, blue tit, cold tit, long tail tit. Now, they look really easy when you're sitting at home in front of your... your um, uh, your laptop. Uh, oh, how how will I ever not tell them? But obviously, when we're in the middle of uh, of, a, uh, of a farmland scrub, um, actual fact, we might not be seeing these. We might just be hearing them. So we're going to go over over the calls of that next week. Um, finches again. Uh, I deliberately left out linnet as as Dave talked about that. But we're going to be talking about the chaffinch, the bullfinch, the greenfinch, and the goldfinch. And again, all the subtleties around their calls. Most likely to see these flying over. Um, but uh, but again, it's very useful to uh, to uh, uh, go over all of those. Um, the thrushes, song thrush, missile thrush, blackbird, uh, and then starling, which obviously it sometimes gets mistaken. But obviously, you know, how could you mistake that? That resplendent uh, sheen on the front. The two really to to note here: the song thrush and the missile thrush. The size, the size, missile thrush is nearly a third bigger uh, than the song thrush. Much much bolder pattern underneath less diffuse, but we'll go, in the, we'll go over that in a bit more detail next week. Um, Dunnocks, wrens, house sparrow robins, all very likely in scrubby areas, uh, particularly wrens. Uh, I've, I've noticed a huge amount of wrens around at the moment as well. Um, Dunnock, we're gonna go into a lot more detail because again, Dunnock can sound a little bit like a white throat or a little bit like a black, uh, black cat. And then lastly, we've got the pigeons, uh, stock dove, feral pigeon and collared dove. Uh, hopefully, uh, you'll you'll know most of these from your garden. But again, we'll go over the whoo whoo and uh, and the collared dove calls next week as well. So, thank you so much. Um, we uh, we did blatantly take some screenshots of the uh, of the Collins uh, uh, e guide. Um, it, I think it's about seventeen ninety nine. It's it's the best app I have on my phone. Uh, I, I've even now. 36 years in the game, I still refer to it. It's got songs on it, it's got calls on it. Um, if you if you can afford it, I would definitely go for it. Uh, definitely try and, uh, and, and get get one, uh, one of the field guides as well. Uh, Zeno Canto, as we talked about earlier for the songs, uh, and we you know we mostly sort of took a lot of the photographs off of Google, um, but uh, uh, just for the uh, express, we're not you know there's, there's this is not going anywhere other than our private group, so. Uh, um, but again, we can share all these uh, these with you. Um, this wonderful slide was uh, was uh, created by Mr. Parmenta, um, and uh, obviously they are his personal favourites. But they're they're fantastic books as well. Uh, we won't go into all of them uh, right now. Needless to say, that they'll they'll be uh, sent out with uh, with the slides as well. And I think that's uh, that's the end. Uh, I do apologise, a, a little bit rushed, but uh, I think we uh, we'll we'll know for next time. Maybe we will schedule in a, a bit longer next time, Nick. Yep, sounds good to me. 